pictures uh, with their phones. And so um, I, uh, when George had first asked me to do a presentation back in, I guess it was uh, uh, December or so, uh, you know, I, I thought about it, but I didn't think about it too much. You know, I figured, well, we'll figure it out. And uh, as, it, as the date got closer and closer, um, I saw that uh, with the, uh, all the virus problems that uh, maybe I wouldn't have to do it. But I spoke to George uh, last week and uh, uh, he said, yeah, it's going to go. and We're going to do it on Zoom. So I had to put something together. And I guess because of this idea of being uh, socially distanced and isolated, uh, that I uh, started to take a much more philosophical approach to photography rather than uh, the, uh, the how, more of the why. And so uh, that's really what this is going to be about today. So, uh, Eckerd, uh, I'm going to start, uh, I guess I can hit uh, this, and then, uh, wait, do I need to hit, uh, share my screen first? Share yeah, screen first, yes. Okay, screen sharing. And then down below. Share. All right. Can you see Bayfront there? Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So again, it's to improve your photography the easy way. But I also thought that maybe it needed a, a subtitle. And I thought that subtitle might be called The Zen of Photography. Now, uh, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. So I'm hoping that uh, I put my bullet points in sentences. So um, you'll be able to read along just in case we have any issues with sound or audio. So before we get started, the key word in the presentation's original title is improve. This really isn't going to be about perfecting your photography. The ideas that I'm going to present here aren't intended to be magic bullets that have any magic power to remedy everything that might be holding your photography back. Improvement, if you conceptualize it as growth, is incremental and gradual, not instantaneous. While it's true that we all learn in different ways, all creative growth starts with an idea. And how you perceive that idea and apply that idea will vary considerably. And that's the point. Allowing yourself to be exposed to the idea of others and then using those ideas in a way that fits your own style is one of the most consistently effective means of, creating, uh, of avoiding creative stagnation. With all that in mind, here's a few ideas that I hope will be of assistance to those who are searching for fundamental yet effective ways to improve their photos. So again, being a, a, a little bit more philosophical, I have the firm belief that the purpose of photography and the act of taking a picture is to capture a moment in time, be it a person, place, or an object. Each captured image has the potential to carry its own unique feeling through time and bring you back with happiness and wonder to the origins of that moment. When you see a photograph, it usually transports you to where you were, who you were with, what was going on, the, the sights, the sounds, the smells. It's more than just a photo, it is a trigger to your memory. Every second that you live is a second more in the past. Every picture that is taken captures those split seconds and stores them timelessly. Photographs are an archive of memories and moments that can be relived as they were when the image is viewed. If a picture isn't taken, those precious memories will be lost forever. Of course, pictures come in many forms from natural in the moment snapshots to carefully staged and manage photo shoots. And whatever form the photograph is taken, the captured image will be forever unique, 
just like a fingerprint. Natural moments cannot be created. They can only be captured in their time. So while the art of photography relies both creati uh, creatively and uh, on both creativity and preparation, the art of a great picture can be very, uh, can very often rely on the emotion that is captured in that instant. Today, photographs can be enhanced and transformed with the click of a mouse, but the greatness of a picture cannot be edited. It's either there or it's not. It cannot be creative. I don't know how many of you are, uh, are interested in the history of photography, but one of my favorite uh, photographers uh, is Henri Cartier-Bresson, and he virtually invented the uh, genre of street photography uh, back in the, uh, well, starting in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and, and uh, until his death in the 80s. Uh, he was always uh, uh, seen with his Leica camera. Uh, and the interesting thing about Cartier-Bresson was that throughout his career, he only used one camera, he only used one lens, he only used one film, but he knew how to do it all. And so I think this is a very timely quote uh, that says that the picture is good or not from the moment it was caught in the camera. Uh, of course, in his day, it was all film, but today, uh, unfortunately, too many people think, well, it's not so good, but I can fix it later. We want to change that idea that we want to do our best to capture it uh, while we're taking the image. A raw amateur can capture as great a picture as a finely trained professional photographer when, <clears throat> when that special fraction of a time is captured in the camera. The main difference in the two individuals is the consistency of getting that great picture at each opportunity and seeing the possibility of a great image in a passing moment. A great picture can come in the simple form of a field of wheat or the innocence in an eye. The little moments can often be the best. So again, whether you're traveling through, uh, through Northern Europe, uh, through Belgium and capturing the fields of wheat, or you're photographing uh, a child or a grandchild, those moments are special and you need to be able to capture them and in such a way that, again, it's pleasing to the eye and that it evokes a memory. Photography styles and consistency can vary, but a great picture is just there. If you carry your camera and you click the button, you'll have that memory to cherish. No matter how talented an eye you may have, if you take the picture, you'll always be able to find that diamond. If you don't, the great moment is gone forever. So let's get ready for the next great moment. First thing that every photographer or wannabe photographer has to re, uh, know is that, that light is everything. In fact, George Eastman said it so succinctly, light makes photography, embrace light, admire it, love it, but above all, know light. Know it for all your worth and you will know the key to photography. So uh, we know that, uh, that Mr. Eastman is, uh, has been in the photography business uh, for, he was in the photography business for a long time. And unfortunately, uh, one of the scientists at Eastman Kodak, uh, a guy by the name of Steve Sasson in 1975, invented the first digital camera. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, Kodak was a victim of its own innovation. Uh, I don't think that anybody there realized how quickly that digital would supplant uh, our, our analog way of taking film, but certainly uh, much more quickly than uh, was anticipated. So let's think about light. I took a trip out to uh, uh, Utah, southern Utah this past summer and uh, went to uh, several national parks, including Arches. And so I'll show you a few pictures that uh, were snapped along the way there. So when we think about lighting, we have to think about uh, the quality of lighting, not only the quantity, not how much light we have to work with, but the quality. And harsh lighting tends to create photos that are unflattering to your subject. Again, we get very, very harsh light. A lot of our subject may be shrouded in shadow. 
but dull light will kind of do the same thing and hence the name flat gives you a very flat picture it's very two-dimensional we don't see a lot of dimension in a photograph so many photographers will talk about certain times when they shoot they'll talk about the golden hour or golden hours uh, or the blue hour the golden hour occurs uh usually uh, at this time of year you would say that probably from Oh, say uh, seven to eight thirty, or uh, seven thirty to eight o'clock in the afternoon, and then we have the blue hour before the sky turns completely black. We have that uh, nice blue hue to the sky uh, about a half an hour after the sun sets. And many photographers claim that they will only shoot at those times. The most important thing is that when you're using natural light the time of day is uh, key. Opt for early morning or late afternoon when the light is soft and flattering, as opposed to midday when the light is harsh. So here's Ponte Vecchio uh, in uh, Florence. Uh, you can see that it's an overcast day. The sky is uh, very kind of featureless, very, very two dimensional. But as the sun sets, we get uh, much more beautiful color, a little bit more dimension because of the shadowing uh, in the photograph. And so light is the first thing we want to think about. Of course, you have light built into your camera, but there's the right way to use flash and the wrong way. And it's really about how to position light. Now, if you're using your iPhone or a small point shoot camera, the flash is going to be, uh, come directly at your subject and it's going to create those hard shadows uh, on the face and uh, kind of white out the flake, uh, white out the face. Uh, if you are fortunate enough that has a camera that has a hot shoe where you can add an external flash, the beauty of that is that we can redirect the light. We can bounce it off of different things like ceilings or walls that will create a much softer, much, uh, uh, much more directional light than that uh, flash that hits straight on. So uh, some photographers, uh, especially studio photographers, think that you need multiple lights in order to take a beautiful picture. You don't. You can take a picture with three lights, that's great, or you can do it with one light. What matters the most is the way that you use and capture light uh, that adds interest to your image. So again, don't do it straight on to do it uh, where the light is coming in at an angle. And if you're using natural light, make sure that you pay attention to where that light comes from. The use of light more than any other factor bears the greatest make or break potential for your photography. So again, don't uh, stay away from that direct head on light. Even if you're in a dark room uh, in indoors, uh, try to shy away from using direct flash on your subjects. So after we understand about light, we need an interesting subject. What is or, in, what is or isn't an interesting subject uh, is subjective on many levels, yet there does seem to be some consensus about the things viewers tend to find interesting. People, landscapes, animals, flowers, and, and so forth. This doesn't mean you're confined to photographing a pre-selective catalog of subjects. You're free to shoot whatever you like. If you're into cardboard boxes, that's great. Uh, as a photographer, most of the things that I do are uh, uh, in commercial photography, I'm shooting widgets. How do you make a widget look interesting? How can you uh, uh, light it? How can you position it so people find it? Oh, that's something that I need to have. But you'll have to figure out how to do it in an interesting way. Of course, choosing a more traditionally interesting subject uh, in the first place will make your work easier, but you still have to present your subject in an interesting manner. And don't forget, much of what adds interest to the subject is the way that it's lit. So this is a dead horse uh, point uh, uh, next to uh, Canyonlands in Utah uh, at sunrise. And uh, again, you can see how the light just kind of scrapes some of the rocks as it's coming up. Visualization is so important because too many people 
are filtering with their brains and they're not seeing the way that the picture should be. Great images require repeat attempts, sometimes over the course of years. Your first image of a particular place or subject will rarely be your best. But with some planning and the right approach, you can shorten the path to perfection. With digital images today being virtually free, it's tempting to think that if you approach the same subject from a dozen angles on a different day, uh, on a given day, and take a few backup shots, you'll get what you're looking for. But that approach fails to take into account that good photography is much more of a mental process than it is a technical one. You probably are familiar with this guy, even if you don't know him by his face. Uh, Ansel Adams uh, is uh, certainly one of the best known photographers, landscape photographers of all times. And uh, here you can see him in his modified uh, Woody station wagon there. Uh, and in the background, you see uh, Yosemite half dome there. And you can see him getting ready to photograph. And one of his most famous photographs of uh, Yosemite uh, happens to be uh, moonrise over half dome. But certainly he didn't do that on his first uh, time out. And certainly there were uh, countless pictures that he had done of Yosemite. Just as a side note, when I was out in uh, Utah, I remembered uh, how he was able to use uh, a higher uh, perspective to get a different type of shot. So I kind of uh, applied that. So looking uh, for what vehicle I wanted to rent at the uh, car rental place, I opted for the uh, the pickup truck, which had a nice easy step, which I could get up into and use as my shooting platform. The secret of a great photograph is, is knowing what it will look like before you press the shutter. There's a lot to be said for training your brain to think more photographically. Doing so will help maximize your chance of success and result in images that you will uh, that you're really proud of. Being active will increase your photography fitness. So too often we get overwhelmed by the complexity of our camera. Even our iPhones sometimes seem to be a little bit more than we uh, than we want to digest. And so we think that they're so advanced they know exactly what we want. And as far as cameras go, any camera, a camera is a lot dumber than you are. Um, cameras don't see things the way that we see them. So we need to understand how the camera is going to see it. And more importantly, how to make our camera see it the way that we want to see it. A good way to begin that process of visualization is to build up a set of mental snapshots when you look at the works of other photographers. When you see an image that appeals to you, try to figure out why. Making the connection between what you respond to and why you respond to it will help you create better images without necessarily being derivative. The next time you venture out with your camera, you will then have a better idea of what you want to achieve. So this is not my photograph, but it's a photograph that was taken by uh, a friend of mine. And obviously it was taken in Vietnam and uh, it's, uh, it's always been one of my favorite photographs because of all the things that are going on in it. So we're going to talk a little bit about composition uh, and perspective uh, a little bit later, but I just wanted to kind of pull out some things uh, that I had seen in the photograph. So the first thing is the way that uh, the subject is framed. So I'm pretty sure that we can all uh, figure out that the woman uh, on the right hand side is the subject. We see that uh, she is nicely uh, uh, separated from the background uh, by the wall there with some sort of uh, writing there in Vietnamese. And uh, also notice that the yoke uh, of those two baskets kind of uh, is a straight line drawn to her. So there's a visual clue there that's telling us, look at this woman's face. Um, not only that, but when we look at the woman, notice how she's, uh, she's, she doesn't have that cheesy 
look that a lot of people would try to do when you're photographing someone. Uh, you know, you want them to look at the camera, you want them to smile. She is going about her business looking for the next person uh, to come by to sell her uh, vegetables. So um, she has a very casual pose, her hands are very nice. Look at the second lady, kind of the lady in the middle there. Look how nicely she is framed between the uh, two yokes of uh, the baskets there. Her face is beautifully framed there. And uh, the third lady, she's kind of getting up or sitting down, we can't tell, but uh, it would have been nice to have all three of them uh, visible. But again, it, it, this is street photography. It's supposed to be spontaneous. It's not posed. So uh, that kind of starts to uh, make the picture interesting. But then when you start thinking about other uh, guidelines in photography, we have something called the rule of odds. So in our picture, we have three women, which is very, very good. Uh, on the ground there, there are five different baskets of produce, which is also uh, very, very nice. And then you start looking at other things. Notice that on the right hand edge of the frame, we have uh, this kind of blue line, uh, looks like a, a pallet or a fence. And below that we have blue plastic. So we start off on the left with stripes of blue and blue plastic. Then we see some red plastic that she's sitting on. We see another red plastic uh, basket or uh, handbag. And then we see another uh, red plastic stool. And then we end up on the other side with blue plastic and a striped shirt or, or a stripes uh, there in the blue, whatever that blue is. So our picture is very, very harmonious. It's book ended. It, it follows so many different uh, guidelines and also look at the perspective. Most of us, if we were walking down the street, we try to be uh, lazy. We stand up and we take the picture. Uh, wherever we are, that's where we take the picture. She actually got down to the level of these women. And so we have a different connection uh, to the photograph because uh, of her choice of perspective. We are now their equal, not their superior. Breaking these images down into smaller elements will help you with visualization. And when you're looking through the viewfinder or screen, keep them in mind. Some of your mental snapshots may include dramatic skies, texture, color contrast, the ability to guide the viewer's eye through an image, or the power images have to take you back to a particular situation. So again, these are some of the things that I like in a photograph. And so when I am shooting, I, uh, when I can, I like to bring at least one and sometimes hopefully all of them into my scene. Someone once said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. I was looking for the uh, author of that. Some people say that it was uh, uh, Arnold Palmer, uh, but it, the, the story goes back that it was originally uh, in the uh, 1800s uh, that somebody uh, had a variation of that. But it's a, it's a very, very good uh, quote. One of the best ways to improve is to keep trying. Repetition isn't just about maximizing your chance of finding the right condition. It also helps you figure out what you want to capture, uh, uh, how you want to capture a certain image. So here we see Ansel back again at, at Yellowstone at Half Dome, um, and trying again. Landscape photography is the supreme test of the photographer and often the supreme disappointment. So again, he knew that it's in order to be successful, you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And uh, you may not be able to tell in this photograph, but he's a lot older here than he was in the first time up on the back of his woody wagon. Notice that I haven't mentioned anything about the tools, techniques, or post-processing. And there's a good reason for that. The means of getting a great image are of secondary importance. If you don't clearly visualize your photographic objective, you'll never reach it, no matter how fancy your lens is or how much skill you have in Photoshop. Your, uh, your first step is to first figure out what you want to take, uh, why, figure out that you want to take this photograph, and second, to figure out how. Most of vice related to photography is dedicated to the how rather than uh, the why. And I mentioned that when I started that most of my presentations have always been that way.
the motivation behind your image is, is much more important than the process. The most important decisions you make about your images are the ones you make before you press the shutter. Aperture, shutter speed, white balance, framing, orientation, etc. And so again, going back to Cartier-Bresson, says that thinking should be done before and after, but not during photographing. You should be involved in the process. All of the things, your setting of your camera, those things should be done prior to post-processing, after, then you're in the moment, the zen of photography. To summarize visualization, first of all, figure out what appeals to you, then figure out why, and finally figure out how to get there. Be prepared to have many failures before you have a success because in photography, as in life, we learn most from our failures, uh, but our failures are what makes us great. And this is probably one of the best quotes, uh, most often quoted uh, of Cartier-Bresson, is that your first 10,000 photos are your worst. And of course, he was shooting film. So I think if we would extrapolate that to digital, I think we would say our first 100,000 photos are going to be our worst. So now comes how we help to visualize. Develop a keen eye for perspective and composition. So once you've found an interesting subject, you need to find an equally appealing visual presentation within the context of the overall image. Apart from lighting, perspective and composition will help you achieve this. Don't be content to shoot everything straight on or at eye level. Pictures taken at five and a half feet above the ground can look or repetitious. Shoot from above or below your subject. Take a non-obvious angle. Think about changing the perspective. Get down on your knee if you're able or on your stomach if possible or stand on a chair. Never get lazy with composition. Good composition isn't mastered, but you owe it to yourself to work on it. Keep in mind though, that there's no need to always get fancy with composition. In fact, sticking to the basics is often the best route. Use the rule of thirds, fill the frame, and then work your way up to using the golden spiral. So I think most of us are familiar with the concept of the rule of thirds, dividing your viewfinder or your screen into thirds, placing your subject along the lines. Filling the frame is pretty obvious as well. You may or may not be familiar with the golden spiral, but that's uh, based on the idea of the perfect shape uh, as exemplified by the nautilus shell. And the Greeks were uh, very familiar with the golden spiral. Uh, it's all, uh, often called the Fabinucci, uh, Fabinacci rule. And not only did the Greeks use it, but so did Leonardo, as well as many, many other artists. And so when we can apply it to our photography, it takes us to a whole different level. Regardless of what perspective you go for or how you choose to compose your shot, your aim is to make sure all the elements in the photograph complement one another and hold the viewer's attention. So let's talk about a few of those rules. So I mentioned earlier about the rule of third. And again, you've probably uh, been familiar, if you're familiar with any of them, it essentially says that if we take our viewfinder divided into thirds horizontally and vertically. We use those lines to line up things in our scene. So where do we place our horizon or where do we place our main subject? Uh, if we start going uh, and, and uh, if we're always centering it, our photographs become really boring. By breaking that uh, habit that you may have of always centering your subject using the rule of thirds, you'll find that your pictures become more interesting. But just like anything else, if you continue to only use the rule of thirds, you're gonna find that your pictures become very boring as well. So uh, think about the rule of thirds. You should be aware that even with your iPhone, your iPhone wants you to use those rule of thirds. And if you go into your settings for your camera, you're actually able to turn on a, a guideline as a visual prompt 
so that you're not always centering your subjects. Another rule that people use is something called leading lines, using visual clues in your picture, being roads or streams or tree branches, lots of different things to lead your viewer's eye into the main subject. So here we can see how leading lines are used to lead us down the walkway uh, to the building in the background. And of course, you can combine rules. You can use leading lines with the rule of thirds. Where's the tree? The tree is in both a horizontal and vertical third. And these rows between the flowers leads our eye back to them. Using framing, isolating your subject by the use of something that occurs in nature or uh, in your vicinity. Sometimes we can use trees, gates, window frames. Uh, if you would have stepped just two steps outward and been uh, uh, hanging out that, uh, that archway there, you'd have nothing but a lot of plain gray sky. By taking a step back and using it, you're filling that negative space, that empty space with something that's far more interesting. And of course, you can combine framing with the rule of thirds as well. Uh, this is out in, um, uh, in Wyoming. Uh, that's the Tetons over there on the left-hand side and the uh, Mormon barns there uh, framed by the fence. Leaving space. And again, with the rule of thirds, where is the bird on the third? Where is uh, going horizontally, of course. And then we have space for the bird to fly into. You don't necessarily want to crowd your uh, uh, subject that's capable of movement into the direction that it's moving. Oh, repeating patterns. Well, you saw the repeating patterns uh, and uh, the repeating patterns there combined with the golden spiral um, are all different ways that we can use these guidelines to help us create much more interesting photographs. Even nature likes to follow those rules. So let's talk about what is and is in composition. As a photographer wants to improve, it's critical you develop the compositional skills. Your abil ability to compose a powerful, visually captivating image is one of the most important keys to a great photograph. So first, let's define what composition is and what it isn't. Many beginners get the wrong notion of a skill and as a result find improvement difficult, if not impossible. To start, composition is not a series of immutable rules or commandments you must follow. Guidelines like the rule of thirds, leading lines, and simplicity are just recommendations with one sole purpose, to get you to see what you were previously blinded to. Each rule makes us aware of a specific visual clue. The rule of thirds, for example, teaches us to see our frame in three separate sections, vertically and horizontally. Leading lines open our eyes to all the visual lines around us. But therein lies their fault. If you rely solely on three, four, seven, or 18, I actually teach a class where I mention 18 compositional rules, uh, you're allowing your vision to be limited. Instead, use compositional rules for what they're meant to do, open our eyes. So how composition should work. And we're gonna talk about each of these things uh, in, uh, and, and show you some good examples. How, you, how to become aware of visual space, how to find and accentuate patterns, how to make entry into your photograph easily, how to keep your picture simple, seek out and control strongest visual clues, think in terms of the frame and leave room for interpretation. Each and every shot you take is comprised of visual space. You have your subject, the background, the foreground, and secondary elements. It's the arrangements of these that determines how viewers respond. Most novices and too many seasoned photographers compose photos the following way. They see a subject, they point their camera at the subject, and they snap their picture. 
Consequently, these compositions tend to have the subject dead center, with little attention to the background, foreground, or objects to the left or right. As a result, the images tend to look cluttered and hard to follow. So here's a, a cute little girl, and we know what the photographer was trying to do, trying to capture her. But look at all the stuff that's going around, uh, uh, going on around her. Uh, not just, you know, what she's doing with her toys and coloring books and Legos and everything else, but look at all the stuff on the counter and, and the brightness of the window that's kind of pulling our eye in that direction. Think about changing perspective and think about changing composition and now it becomes really about her. Remember those nice leading lines and diagonals that we had? Nice lighting. So your first step to improving your composition is simple. Become aware of all the visual space within your frame. Find the subject you want to capture and then make it a point to observe all elements within the frame. What objects are to the left of your subject, the right, above, below, what colors are present, which grab the most attention, which fall under the radar and, uh, and are obscured. Awareness begins the process of change. By becoming aware of all these elements within the frame, you start to recognize visual space, visualization. This recognition allows you to better control it. You cannot uh, change what you do not know exists. Um, one of, uh, I can't remember uh, Bush's uh, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, who said, uh, we don't know what we don't know, uh, but uh, that's uh, kind of a paraphrase of that. Start simple by exploring the visual world around you. When you see a great photograph or work of art, analyze it. What did the artist do with the space they were given? Uh, I have always loved art history. I remember as a, as a kid, you know, five, six, seven years old, uh, my dad took an art history class and he was a, 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 an excellent amateur painter. Oh, he was, he was fabulous. I loved to watch him paint. Uh, and, I wish, and I always wanted to be a painter, but I never had the skill set necessary. But I always loved art history and I loved to look at works of art. All photographers have the same approximate viewfinder. It's only a select view, however, that can turn this empty space into something breathtaking. Uh, this is a, a painting that I've always loved. Uh, again, I don't know how many of you know uh, uh, Jan van Eyck, uh, and this is called the Arnolfini uh, Portrait. And there are just so many beautiful details in here that, uh, that, that sometimes we ignore because they are there, but they all have meaning. For instance, over here where the window is, uh, there is a, uh, uh, it's a cherry tree, a cherry blossom, and uh, cherry blossoms. And so we know this was painted in uh, early, uh, late spring, early summer. Here we see oranges, and the oranges there are uh, significant because they speak to the wealth of, uh, of this couple. Uh, this, is, this was uh, painted in Burgundy, and to have oranges when you live in Burgundy, you obviously had to have a lot of money. The dog here, uh, the dog is a uh, Brussels griffin, and it signifies the fidelity of the marriage. Back here we see a concave mirror, and not only if you uh, zoom in, would you see the, uh, the uh, backsides of the, uh, of the couple, you would also see uh, the painter himself. You'll notice that there is one candle lit uh, in the uh, painting here, uh, the, uh, the sculpture here on the bedpost, uh, St. Margaret, and she is the patron saint of, uh, of um, maternity. So there's so many things going on here that the details speak to this picture. And uh, we, if we understand what they meant, we get a much fuller understanding of what this painting is actually about. Great composers understand that control over visual space is key. You also need to control this space. Control over visual space allows you to guide the viewer exactly how you'd like. 
you dictate what draws their eyes. You dictate what they look at first. And you dictate how they'll emotionally respond. When you understand how to control and guide your viewer, taking great composition is really quite intuitive. Okay, so again, here is uh, one of the arches, the double arch at Arches National Park. Uh, again, you'll see the spiral and uh, you may even see the leading lines of people going up to it. Again, things in the foreground, your subject, things in the background. All these have to go into uh, part of creating your picture. Without light, you don't have anything to see, that's obvious. As you add light, lines and shapes begin to emerge, and with these, patterns. Finding and responding to visual patterns is natural habit of our mind. Objects of the same color, shape, size, or light intensity tend to be categorized as similar. This allows our mind to float right past these similar elements along to the next visual piece, uh, piece of visual novelty. So in this photograph, notice again what we have. We have beautiful uh, symmetry. Uh, our uh, picture is symmetrical on both sides, as we would imagine bridges to be. The reflection in the water is, always, uh, is also symmetrical. Notice we have formal lines, horizontal lines and vertical lines tend to be very static, tend to be uh, very solid. But we also have nice diagonal lines, and diagonal lines are much more dynamic. They lead our eyes in different directions. But it is this combination, these patterns. Uh, we see the, the openness on both sides of the bridge uh, that uh, are uh, great for our eye to uh, wander through. And of course, the swan there as the subject. What happens when you look at a tree? There are thousands upon thousands of leaves, but your mind filters out this excess and renders a shape, the typical tree outline that you would draw when you were in grade school. When our minds look at a photograph, however, patterns become much more difficult to find. Without the ability to see depth in an image, everything in our three-dimensional world is compressed into one flat dimension. If the image is not composed so that this one-dimensional shot is easy to grasp and utilizes patterns, many people will skip right past it. So again, very, very flat. We see the pattern, but it's very, very, uh, it, it leaves us kind of wanting more. The way to avoid this is to compose without clutter. Patterns are everywhere around you. Becoming more aware of these patterns makes composition so much easier. Patterns create simplicity, which makes viewers find your photographs more easy to digest. By luring viewers in with a pattern, you can then guide them from corner to corner, allowing them to explore the subtleties of your image. So here we have just a few patterns, but it's so simple and great lighting uh, makes it interesting. Skeins of yarn, even in nature, are zebras wonderful patterns. And in architecture, we have beautiful patterns. Make entry into your photograph easy. One of the most difficult tasks of composition is getting your viewer into the frame. Once this is accomplished, everything else is secondary. Fortunately, the use of lead-ins makes this process quite simple. Leadings are simple visual clues that give viewers, uh, that guide viewers into the content of your frame. They are constructed the same way that you would construct a lead-in in the physical real world. If you want to make your home look inviting, do you leave the door open or do you close it? When saying hello to a friend, do you cross your arms into horizontal barriers or open your arms into a diagonal visual producing perceived lines towards your body. Well, I guess we do the former nowadays, but when this all passes, I think we'll get back to shaking hands. At least I know I will. So again, where do the lines lead you? So on the left-hand side, we have these great diagonals made up of repeating patterns that lead us in. Where is our horizon? On the third, and there's a, a that horizon leads us in, and where does it lead us? It leads us right to the lighthouse. Repeating patterns of the lights and the trees 
and the leading lines of the walkway all lead us to a central point down the way. And where? To that nice light area that is different than all of the darkened areas. This is a photograph by Cartier-Bresson. And you'll notice that the bike, uh, the gentleman on the bike is very blurry and that's not important. This is one of his most famous works. But look at how all of the lines in the photograph lead us to that particular bicyclist. Lead-ins guide the viewer from the corners of the frame towards the inner areas. They tend to form imaginary lines that guide the viewers. So walkways are great for that. A foreground figure looking towards the center of a frame is a typical example, as is an archway leading viewers to look within the outlines of its context. So easy in for our images. The use of lead-ins makes compositions easier to grasp as they give a quick, easy path for viewers to follow. Instead of observing the image and trying to determine what to look at, viewers intuitively follow the lead-in. This makes visual communications easier and much more uh, efficient. However, even the best lead-in will not save a photograph that's too complex for viewers to grasp. So, keep the image simple. It's easy to take photos with dozens of varying elements within the frame. Capturing an image with several elements carefully structured into a cohesive, simplistic whole is a lot more difficult. The ability to bring order from chaos has become one of the uh, skills uh, most admired in photography. So how do you compose images with simplicity? To start, remember that your photograph is comprised of visual space and not all of this visual space is equal. Some elements will carry more weight than others. So here's a photograph, uh, it's a Coast Guard ship, and look at how it's just all jammed together. Uh, we don't know what to look. We know that we're looking at part of a boat, but it's just such a jumble that our, our brain wants to explode. Um, and uh, Part of what is causing that is the use of a telephoto lens. When you have a telephoto lens and you zoom in, it always will tend to compress things laterally. So things uh, tend to stack up uh, uh, on one another and things that are, uh, should recede into the background and become smaller actually become much larger. And so here's kind of a, a similar situation in that we're dealing with boats, but look how much more cohesive this is. The boats are in one area. The trees are in one area. The sky is, uh, or the mountains are in another area. So although we have a lot of different things going on here because of their arrangement, because of their composition, it's much more pleasing, much more gentle on our mind. Most varying elements will clash with one another. Several varying colors will compete for attention as will objects of different shapes, sizes, and depth. By eliminating multiplying varying elements and focusing on a few, you simplify your image. So we have the woman in the chair, we have the fence, certainly uh, there's the, uh, the town in the background, the uh, mountain, but because of the weight that we give to her, her position in the frame, we know that this is most important. And again, because we know that she's looking out, we tend to look out and our eye kind of moves through this uh, as it should. Although photography is quite different from theater, your camera should work to act as somewhat of a spotlight. Use it to isolate a specific theme, a unique pattern, and minimize the details of everything else. I think that all of us would see that the, uh, the young man sitting on the chair uh, there towards the center is the, uh, is the subject here. And all of the other parts tend to emphasize him. So how do you isolate outside of using shallow depth of field or perspective? You seek out and control the strongest visual clues. When many people think of simplicity, the thought of a shallow depth of field and perspective usually come to mind. 
So cello, a depth of field is how much of your picture appears in focus. So depending upon the camera you use, you're able to control the camera's aperture to regulate how much is in focus. So here we only see the young lady in focus. As we get to the background, it becomes out of focus. For those of you that use the iPhone and you have a, uh, an iPhone that has multiple lenses, you know that you have a portrait mode. The idea behind the portrait mode is to simulate the look that we get uh, by using a shallow depth of field to isolate your subject. If you shoot from below, now your subject becomes basically sky, so that helps to isolate your subject as well. Or if you shoot down from a higher angle, it tends to eliminate a lot of clutter, going back to that great spiral. With that said, strong visual clues are much more influential, uh, more influential over simplicity. Look how small the woman in the red dress is compared to everything else, but yet your eye goes directly to her. Bright colors, light traps, which are areas of brightness surrounded by darker areas, and strong shapes are all examples of strong visual clues that naturally draw our eyes. Now, of course, she again is where? In the rule of thirds. And look how beautifully isolated she is. Look at a couple other. This lady in white beautiful landscape but again because of her positioning because she has greater contrast than the background our eye goes there immediately even a silhouetted figure that's the least amount of detail in the entire scene but because it's against a very bright background our eye tends to go right to that spot strong visual clues no matter if they're in the background of a shallow depth of field image shot from above will steal all the attention. When you have multiple strong visual uh, cues combined together within one frame, you tend to produce confusion and avoidance. So again, too many photographers get so involved in their subject that they're not looking all the way through their viewfinder. And so you end up with what I call eye stags, things that kind of pull your attention away from where they should be. And so here's this bright spot uh, with the poppy there. Uh, our eye goes up to the bright spot instead of looking at the bee. And then we have these other pink flowers that again are competing. Even things like, uh, I call them black holes, areas that are darker than your subject, uh, because again, of the difference of contrast, pull your eye away from the subject. Avoid this by ensuring that the strongest visual cue is your primary subject. If other secondary elements have strong visual cues, work to eliminate or minimize them through your composition. Stand on your toes, crouch down, or use different focal lengths that will remo remove these visual cues. This will simplify your image and produce that spotlight effect that guides viewers to exactly what you want. Think in terms of your frame. Here's a quick composition check. When you go out and take photographs, what do you set as the four corners of your frame? If you're like most, you rely on your camera's viewfinder to do this. And while that's convenient, forcing yourself to see the world through your camera's viewfinder re uh, robs you of control and creativity. You are essentially following your camera's frame guidelines and trying with all your might to fill this frame with what can be labeled a beautiful composition. And that is all wrong. Instead, see the world around you and find exactly what you want to capture. Where do you want the four corners of your frame to be? Um, they sell these uh, online. They're really for painters, but they work so well when you're trying to visualize. You, want, you don't want to buy something, find a piece of black cardboard and cut it out and use that as your guideline. That's a great way to learn how to compose. And short of everything else, We've all seen the, in the Hollywood movies where uh, people do that, the frame, it works very well. You're not blacking everything else around it. You're able to see, and then that way you're able to figure out 
this is where I want to compose. Once you've, once you've decided this, use your camera as what it is, a tool. Capture the image and visualize the exact aspect ratio, uh, the width to height. Although your camera may not create the aspect ratio you desire, a quick crop in any photo editor can fix this in seconds. Move closer to your subject. Too many photographers think that a zoom lens is the ultimate accessory for their camera. And that's a total misconception. The most important accessory to, your, to any photographer is their feet. And unless you're on safari where getting closer to the animals might get you eaten, using your feet is essential. Robert Kappa uh, is a, a very famous uh, photographer, a war photographer, uh, who uh, along with Cartier-Bresson uh, started a, an organization called Magnum Photos. You may have heard of it. And Robert Kappa, unfortunately, uh, followed his own, uh, uh, his own uh, quote here. If your photographs aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. And he happened to be in, uh, in Vietnam, Indochina at the time, back when the French were fighting. And uh, he was uh, trying to get ahead of the battle and unfortunately stepped on a landmine and uh, ended his life, I think, back in 1954. But uh, that quote is certainly very important. Too many people are afraid, I guess now with social distancing, we have to do that. But uh, again, when this is over, or if you're not photographing another person, it's a good rule to follow. When you get up close, you'll see more of your subject and the image will probably be, be a lot better quality. As you move in towards your subject, you'll find yourself framing the scene or person with far more attention to the detail. So the old lady pushing you away because she doesn't want you to take her picture. Okay, so what do we see here? Well, we see a nice young man and we see trash in the background and trash uh, by in the bottom left corner. But when you get closer, it's really all about the young gentleman. And again, you can create a, a kind of a nice abstract. We know that it's a horse, uh, but seeing the eyelashes of the horse make a much more interesting photograph. And where does the eye go? Into the third, of course. Respect the technique. There have been a great many photographs which lack one or more of the traditional hard uh, hallmarks of good photography. Photographs that are a bit out of focus or ardently composed or a little bit noisy or grainy. So remember I said that uh, when a subject is capable of movement, they should be moving into the frame rather than out of it. Well, here's Cartier-Bresson again. And what does he photograph? He photographs this gentleman uh, jumping uh, across a puddle. Uh, and uh, and uh, you'll notice that uh, the subject is blurry. So we've broken a lot of rules here. Most people would be uh, aghast at having a blurry silhouetted subject. But this is one of the most famous photographs, uh, mainly because um, Cartier-Bresson was known for uh, uh, a phrase that he used, the decisive moment. When do you actually push the shutter? And you'll notice that in the decisive moment, this man's foot is not in the water yet. It is just uh, an inch above the water. So that was a decisive moment as to when to take the picture. Indeed, gesture can often have a far greater impact than proper exposure. But let's be honest, you do have to know what you're doing with the camera. There is a certain, a certain minimum threshold of skill you must acquire before you can pass off your work as avant-garde or abstract and expect anyone to take you seriously. Most people, again, might just say, hey, that's a blurry photograph. So you have to learn the basics of photography, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, depth of field, lighting. Learn to get it right in the camera. Learn that when your camera is showing you these numbers, it's showing you them for a reason. There is a purpose to all these symbols. Know that that camera is set to capture exactly what you want to capture the way you want to capture it. And after that, you can break all the rules you want. It's an illusion that photos are made with the camera. They are made with the eye, heart, and head. 
how many times, for those of you that are into photography, how many times do you show someone a great photograph and the first question out of their mouth is, oh, what camera did you take that with? Like, if they had that camera, they could take that picture. That would be like any of us going to Beethoven and said, oh, what piano is that? I want to play just like you. Um, so it's important to have the skill, but photographs, again, are made with the eye, the heart, and the head. Process your photos with care. Unless it's your desire to be labeled as a digital artist, it's best to avoid a heavy-handed approach to uh, post-processing. Additionally, don't use post-processing as a way of attempting to compensate for poor technique. Far too many people do that. Post-processing should, sh uh, should serve to maximize the visual appeal of an already strong photo. You'll almost always want to perform some degree of post-processing on your files, whether it's sharpening, cropping, tweaking white balance, adjusting levels and curves. If you know what that means, that's a good thing. Or reduce, uh, reducing noise. But you want the final image to be somewhat of an idealized version of what you originally imagined for your shot, something you visualized, not something you've Photoshopped the life out of. Okay, we don't want that in our pictures. And sometimes color distracts. If you're out taking photographs of patterns or shapes, surroundings are often distracting, especially if bright colors are present. Converting these photos to black and white can make your focus more clear. So in this photograph, we have the blue above her, we have the red and red really tends to pull in a, a person's eye. Uh, what happens when we convert the image to black and white? Well, now we have all neutral tones and our emphasis is shifted. And we see patterns a lot easier in black and white. Imagine if this were, uh, had red uh, carpet or red fabric uh, on the uh, pews. Always take your photos in color because you can always change them to monochrome if that's what suits you. And leave room for interpretation. This presentation is focused quite a bit on controlling the visual experience of your viewers. While this may seem to be a strange approach to photography, composition is nothing more than the design of a user's visual experience. Great designs create great photographs. With that said, a great composition is more than just an image filled with directions. True art to composition is in amb ambiguity. Yes, you want to uh, compose to guide your viewer into your frame. And yes, you want to simplify your arrangement so as not to confuse and annoy. But you also want your viewer to be an active participant in your visual work. An image that is, too, that is easy to grasp is often just as boring as a complicated image that's too difficult. Great compositions, while usually visually simple, contain an element of ambiguity, an element of intrigue, an element that, if you ask a thousand people about it, you'd get a thousand unique interpretations. It's here where a truly beautiful composition shines. Remember that beauty is indeed in the eyes of the beholder. So again, if you see this picture, some of us might think of it as comedic. Uh, two guys pushing uh, a, a body of a car uh, on uh, a two-wheeled uh, cart uh, down the street in, uh, uh, in uh, India. But other people might see the, uh, might feel the sympathy for people that are uh, in such destitute poverty that this is the only way that they can get a car body from point A to point B. The same thing here. Um, we see this uh, woman uh, and she is obviously cooking, uh, probably cooking dinner for her son that's over in the other corner. We can see that she's probably cooked there a lot because we see all the soot that's on the wall behind her. Uh, we see, you know, all the ways that she's preparing on the ground there. And yet there's kind of an irony uh, that the sign above her is for shampoo. Uh, this photograph in Beirut, 
here a woman is going uh, through what so many mothers do every day for their children. She's peeling potatoes for dinner and look at how she has to live with the build, uh, bombed out buildings behind her. But yet uh, her, her role as a mother supersedes everything else. She knows that this is what she has to do regardless of the situation. And again, she's beautifully dressed. Her, the red of her, uh, uh, of her uh, clothing, the red of the bowl, uh, uh, the red behind her, all bring her eye into here, the nice blue, the coming blue uh, of her headscarf and uh, the uh, uh, shutter and even some of the blue in the young girl's dress. Uh, the, uh, the positioning of this woman uh, with the, obviously a street scene uh, lit at night, you can tell from the different uh, directions uh, of the uh, of the light, the street lights, how they're uh, causing different uh, uh, shadows in different directions. Is it safe for her to be out there? You know, we think about these things as photographers, as we are trying to imagine what the photographer is saying. Look at this picture. Um, of course, our first uh, inclination is to go to the uh, the lady there sitting on the chair. Uh, but as we look, uh, there's a real strong diagonal uh, with her leg and her body. It leads up to that blue uh, spot on the wall. And then as we start to look at the wall, we see that there's a face in the wall there. And as our eye again continues to go around, we have a little bit of blue in the background on the left hand side. Coming around, we see the cat. The cat it, it, miraculously is the same color as the wall uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the masonry behind it. And then we have this beautiful uh, mosaic tile floor. So our, our, we go around and we see all of these things. And again, we interpret them uh, in our own way as to how we respond to the photograph. And here as well. So we have this beautiful uh, young lady standing in the doorway. We, uh, and look how well framed it is uh, over here on the left hand side. So the rest of our picture tells the story about where she is, how the gentleman in front is uh, selling his produce uh, just on uh, a couple of crates and a couple of boards there. So again, we all interpret our photograph the way our experience dictates how we should interpret it, the ambiguity of the picture. Never think these thoughts though. Never think I am not a good photographer, so why try? This one thought will paralyze your future in photography. Change your thinking now. Even if you're not happy with your pictures, you can and will get better with a little effort. Never think there's too much to learn about cameras and software. Sure, there is a lot of software out there and a lot of camera equipment available, but you're not going to be required to have all of it or even a lot of it or learn it all in order to be a good photographer. Never think it takes too much time to become a good photographer. Totally false. Of course, you'll get better as time goes on and you'll become more familiar with how to take photos and use your camera. But if you learn these few basics, it will make a world of difference in your picture quality. So in conclusion, these ideas simply serve as a jumping off point. Anyone can easily expand and build on each of them. Don't overthink any of this stuff though. The most important thing you can do is practice with purpose and it will all come together eventually. The bottom line with any photography learning experience is figuring out how to take great images. That is, the result, uh, that is the result all of us are looking for. If we aren't actually taking great photos, then what's the point of learning? By putting into practice these simple steps, your photography will improve immediately. Remember that a picture is worth a thousand words, but a great picture is priceless. And of course, it's all luck. <laughs> great, great, great presentation. Can we uh, unmute everybody so we can give them a hand of applause? 